we cannot effectively talk about sexual purity if we do not speak about infidelity, its devastating effects on relationships and even on the people who fall prey to it. The question is, can a relationship survive infidelity? If so, how is that possible and what must be done? Well, let's get things straight. Good morning and welcome to day 38 of 40 Days of Sexual Purity, hashtag 40DSP. Today I'll be speaking about infidelity recovery, focusing on the definition of infidelity as it pertains to sexual purity, the effects and implications of infidelity, the cause and root of infidelity, and of course, what to do after there has been infidelity in a relationship. So, stay right there. Hey, we are almost at day 40. And if this series has been a blessing to you, then we still need you to spread the word so that we can reach more people. Here's what you can do. Please like this video, write a comment on this video, share this video with all your friends across all your social media platforms. Subscribe to this channel if you're not subscribed. And of course, please invite five people to subscribe to this channel. Thank you. All right, let's get back to it. So, we have spoken about sexual immorality in almost every way all through this series on sexual purity. However, the focus of today's episode is the effect of sexual immorality on another relationship, specifically when there has been betrayal in the form of infidelity. First and foremost, when do we say there has been infidelity in a relationship? It is important that we give this definition for better context. So, infidelity means that one who is in a committed relationship with another person has intentionally indulged in any form of erotic or sexual activity, sexual stimulation, or sexual commitment with a third party who is not a part of the commitment. Now, this will include but may not be limited to activities like flirting, sexting, cuddling, caressing, kissing, lustful looking, fellation, foreplay, sexually stimulating touch, or any form of sexual intercourse. The truth is that when it comes to infidelity, there's much more that could be included in the definition. However, today we are focusing on infidelity as it pertains to sexual purity. Here is a fact. We cannot say that one was unfaithful to their partner if there was no sin involved. If one is unfaithful to someone they are dating or engaged to, then it means that there was sexual immorality with someone else, and that's fornication. If one is unfaithful to their spouse, then it means that there was equally sexual immorality with someone else, and in this case, that would imply adultery. So, if anyone is found guilty of infidelity in a relationship, then they are equally guilty of sexual immorality before God. And while such a person needs God's forgiveness, because that's quite important, they equally need their partner's forgiveness. In fact, if the unfaithful partner is actually married, then they need their partner's forgiveness even more because of the covenant of marriage. Infidelity means that you have sinned against God, you have sinned against your own flesh, just like every other sin of sexual immorality as the Bible says. But it also means that you have sinned against your partner because of your commitment or covenant with them that was broken. The truth is that for different people, the gravity of each action is different. For example, your partner may not be as hurt that you kissed or looked at someone else lustfully as if you actually had sexual intercourse and perhaps bore a child with someone else. This means that it is important to understand your partner's needs and definitions of infidelity, how far they go and how much value they place on these things. The truth is, no matter what your partner thinks about any of these acts and while different acts 
may have varying consequences in different relationships, it doesn't make any of these actions less sinful or any one action less grievous or more sinful than the other before God. You see, so no matter what you did in the form of infidelity, understand that before God, you have sinned equally. However, before your partner, this may be varying in terms of consequence. And so, here are the effects and implications of infidelity in a relationship. Number one, as we have already established, infidelity means that the person who was found to be unfaithful has sinned against God, has also sinned against their own body, but also has sinned against their partner. In other words, infidelity implies the presence of sin. Infidelity largely breaks an individual's fellowship and intimacy with God. In the case of marriage, the two have become one flesh. This equally implies that the union has been defiled or adulterated by sin. Do you know that the word adulterate actually means to render of lower quality or standard? It means that in very strict spiritual terms, the marital union is guilty of sin. That is so powerful and so important to note that even the partner who did not commit sin and is not guilty of the act or does not have what we call imputed sin, did not do the wrong thing, that person will still face the consequences or the effects of the sin because of the union and the covenant. See, when you think about stuff like this, you have to be careful because it means that if you are unfaithful to your partner, you equally make them guilty because of their union to you. The marital union has been adulterated. It has been rendered of lower quality. Before God, while the person who has fallen needs to repent, you also need to repent as a couple. And when we explain this to couples, and when we walk couples through infidelity recovery, this is a very important point. That as much as you need to forgive your partner, you and your partner need to come before the Lord to seek forgiveness so that the Lord can restore the quality of the union, the spiritual quality of that union. Now, it is even worse if it is the husband who falls into sin because the husband is the head of the union and if the head has fallen, then the body is basically inexistent. It is such a grievous thing for a man to fall prey to infidelity. And when you think about it, you start to wonder, isn't it sad how much the devil fights men when it comes to sexual purity and faithfulness? Isn't it interesting to see how much the devil pushes agendas and narratives like all men cheat? In fact, the devil has pushed this agenda so much that women echo it. More women say all men cheat and by so doing, they are propagating a demonic narrative. This is not to say that women do not cheat or are never unfaithful to their partners or that it is less of a sin when women do. But spiritually speaking and considering the marital union as created by God, when a man is unfaithful to his spouse, then the entire body and in this case, I mean the entire family is exposed to spiritual danger. So when you listen to this as a man, you decide to be careful. That's why the devil is fighting men. That is the implication of infidelity, especially on the man. And of course, the devil will always go to attack in the area where God has placed meaning. You see, the devil does not attack animals and the reason is very simple. It is because God has not placed as much importance on animals as he has placed on humans. Equally, when it comes to marriage, the devil largely attacks the husbands, the men, because of the value that God has placed on the man as the head of the home, as the head of the family and the head of the marital union. So if you're listening to this and you're a man, there is a need to wake up and to make the decision that you will not push forth 
the devil's agenda of infidelity. Number two, infidelity means that several elements of intimacy in the relationship have been broken. Now, among several other things, this would mean that unusual access has been given to another person who isn't part of the union. It also means that attention is usually broken or dispersed. So when one person is unfaithful, it usually means that the other person is not getting their full attention. It means that there is affection deficit. And in other words, the person usually who has been unfaithful is no longer bringing their affection or is in affection deficit. It also means that vulnerability has been shared with a third party. In other words, a third party has seen parts of my partner that they were not supposed to see. That means intimacy is broken. It also means that exclusiveness and preference have been granted to a third party. You see, God created marriage to exist in intimacy. And one of the elements of intimacy is exclusiveness. Once that has been shared with someone else, the union is affected. It also means that the partner has been dishonored seriously. When you're unfaithful to your partner, you dishonor them. You disgrace them. In fact, the partner feels like they have been dealt a great disservice. Most partners, especially women who are subject to infidelity, it means whose partners have been unfaithful to them, usually will also deal with shame. It also means that commitment, more often than not, has been broken and the relationship is suffering. So when you're unfaithful, it usually ends up with a break, a breakup or a termination of the relationship. In most cases, even when the relationship is not terminated officially, the intimacy dies and there is a breach in trust because of the betrayal, leaving the other partner feeling resentment. All right. So they feel anger. They feel frustration. They feel bitterness. Sometimes the other partner is left in fear. They are just never certain of whether this is going to happen or not. Sometimes they will deal with shame, with mistrust, and sometimes even guilt and a desire to rebel or retaliate. So when you're unfaithful to your partner, you break intimacy in the relationship and you expose your partner to so much harm. Not only does your partner sin because they are married to you, that's in the case of a marital union, or their marriage is now guilty of sin, now you also expose your partner to some feelings like resentment, anger, shame, and guilt, which are open doors for sin. So when you're unfaithful to your partner, the first is, yes, there has been sin, but second, intimacy is broken and your partner is exposed to sin and is exposed to the devil. The relationship suffers. So when there's infidelity, first, your relationship with God suffers. But second, the relationship really suffers. Now, number three, infidelity also implies that the individual who was unfaithful is also grievously affected. As in most cases, they will struggle with feelings of anxiety, depression, guilt, shame, self-hatred, anger, and even an identity crisis. Sometimes the guilt and shame are so devastating that it eventually shapes their sense of identity. They tell themselves, if I've done this before, then I can just keep on doing it because I'm shameless. So your relationship with God suffers when there's infidelity. Your relationship with your partner suffers. And even your sense of identity, your relationship with yourself, your wholeness suffers. You see, this is so important. When you understand the consequences and the effects of infidelity, you will be ready to wage the warfare against it. People have often asked, what are the causes of infidelity? People have asked, where does infidelity come from? In fact, if you go online and you type the word infidelity on certain platforms, maybe on Facebook or Quora or just on Google, you would see that one of the most asked questions is why do men cheat because a lot of people feel that men cheat more than women in my personal experience there is equal amounts of infidelity both in men and women 
The only difference is that men are more, you know, fidgety when they fall into, into this sin. But I can tell you that this is a global pandemic on the family mountain and it must be addressed very carefully. And so here are my top five reasons. Of course, there could be more reasons, but I believe that most reasons can be summarized under these five. Number one, individuals will struggle with infidelity or will fall prey to it if they have had some practice. You see, when we were growing up, we often said practice makes perfect. Now, here are some things which I consider as practice. If you have had sex before marriage, then you were being unfaithful to God. And I can assure you that you will most likely be unfaithful to your partner. Any form of premarital sex is practice for infidelity. Number two, if you have ever been unfaithful to your partner, you stand a high chance of doing it again. Most people who are unfaithful have done it before because of how much it shapes their identity. Next, if you struggled with pornography and masturbation or any of them, then you have trained your mind to enjoy variety and so you may struggle with infidelity. You see, you got used to being turned on by different people in your porn channels or your porn movies and right now, you will struggle to be turned on by one person for life. If you have ever dated multiple partners or had sex with multiple people at a time, then you may struggle with infidelity. Now, all of these are different forms of practice. And so I said, if you have had any form of practice, you will struggle with infidelity. So having any form of practice in infidelity weakens your defenses and your boundaries. It equally inhibits your ability to say no. I tell people, the more you say no to sin, the more you will say no. However, the more you say yes to sin, the more you will say yes. So I can tell you, when it comes to sin, please pack more no's under your belt. The more you say no, the more you will build the confidence to say no and the more you will actually say no. You see, if you are saying yes to porn, if you are saying yes to flirting, then that's an easy way to begin to say no to your commitment to your partner. So there is no world in which porn, especially flirting, all of these things I mentioned are okay. Because while you may think that infidelity is only when there's penetrative sex and all that, you are really deceiving yourself. If you have followed this series, you know the definition of sex. And so when you start saying yes to these different acts, even if they may not hurt your partner, you are training yourself to say no to your partner. You are letting a third party come in and enjoy intimacy that was meant to be cultivated only with your partner. Number two, individuals will struggle with infidelity when their needs and expectations from their partner are not met. Now, largely when we talk about needs, we are talking about emotional needs of love, of care, affection, attention, intimacy, kindness, affirmation, admiration, adventure, or desire. We are also talking about physical needs such as touch, sex, time spent together, activities done together, memories created together. These are all serious needs. And sometimes the needs go beyond all of this. But you see, when needs or expectations are not properly communicated and met, then intimacy gaps are created which the individuals may tend to feel elsewhere. Unmet needs have been recorded by counselors to be one of the top reasons for infidelity. In women, it is usually the unmet needs of care, affection, attention, intimacy, kindness, and affirmation. In men, it is usually the unmet needs of affirmation, admiration, adventure, and desire or just the need to feel wanted. So men need a lot more adventure and desire. That's in general. And women need a lot more affection. And when these needs are not met, then the women will tend to find affection elsewhere and the men will tend to find adventure and admiration elsewhere. And largely, both for men and women, sexual satisfaction is a huge need 
that exposes either party to the temptation of infidelity. When needs are not met, then people are most vulnerable. In fact, even the Bible says that if you're going to withhold sexual intimacy from your partner because you're seeking the Lord's face, the Bible actually prescribes that this must be done only at your partner's permission. And in fact, the Bible precisely says it must be done for a time so that the devil will not tempt your partner to sin. In other words, even the Bible recognizes that when needs are not met, your partner could be exposed. This is why you must constantly communicate and talk about needs and expectations in a relationship. Number three, individuals will struggle with infidelity when they struggle with deep emotional wounds that cause them to find solace and comfort in sexual activity with the third party in question. You see, when people have learned to eat the fruit of enticement much more than they would sow the seed of desire and actually do the work to see it grow in their relationship, then they may tend to seek solace and comfort in sexual activity with new people over and over. You see, I always tell people there is a thrill of new sexual adventure, the excitement of newfound love and the spark of new desire. And all of these things come with a rush of adrenaline. You see, when you meet someone for the first time, that neurosis period where they are looking at you, they see you, sometimes that period is meeting a need. Maybe your partner was no longer seeing you, affirming you, appreciating the things about you that once caused them to have wonder and intrigue for you. You see, all of those things bring a rush of adrenaline, which the individual might be addicted to or dependent on. Sometimes people love activities that build enticement, but usually fear commitment. Sometimes people would find their validation in the praise of others and may even gloat in such affirmation. When you find that new person or that other person, that third party, and they are affirming you and loving you and showing you all of this affection, sometimes you know that they are coming for something, but there's a deep inner wound in your soul that needs to find validation from whatever they are telling you. For example, a guy might even stay in an abusive relationship simply because he is made to believe that he is good in bed. All of that is meeting a deep inner wound. It tells you that you have a real wound in your soul that you need to heal from. And this kind of person would usually like activities like flirting, sexting, cuddling, caressing, kissing, lustful looking, fellation, foreplay, sexually stimulating touch and all of that all because of the adrenaline rush. And I tell you also, people who responded to depression, anxiety, guilt, or shame with a sex addiction. So for example, they used sex addiction such as masturbation or porn as a coping mechanism would usually tend to have a higher proclivity towards infidelity. Wounds in your soul will affect your personal boundaries and also your ability to say no. So you need to heal. If there are wounds in your soul, you are largely susceptible to infidelity. Number four, individuals will struggle with infidelity when they come from a history or a heritage of infidelity. This sounds really banal, but it is very serious. If your parents, your authority figures, or the culture you come from celebrates infidelity, has practiced infidelity or adultery, then you stand a higher chance or risk of falling prey to infidelity. Because what you have seen in your parents, even if you hated it, is an indication of that which you must pay attention to in your life. As we have discussed all through this series, bloodline patterns or what I call soul heritage are real. And so you must diligently focus the word of God on anything that you grew up seeing which you do not want in your own life and your own relationships. If it existed in your past, it may exist in your present. This is why as an individual, you have to understand that if you fall prey to 
infidelity, you are also putting your children at risk. Number five, individuals will struggle with infidelity when they do not have a personal why, a personal value, or a personal purpose for fidelity in their relationship. So, if you believe that as a man, you must cheat or you cannot do without it, well, go right on and just do it because you already believe it anyways. If you believe that infidelity is what must exist, you will most likely do it. Now, if you do not have a personal why, a personal purpose or value for fidelity in your relationship, then you will be unfaithful to your partner over and over. Somebody said when purpose is not known, then abuse is inevitable. This means also that if you have a strong why, then you will invest in strong accountability systems to ensure that you remain on track. Great players usually have great coaches. The question would be, is it then possible to remain faithful? Considering all of these five reasons why people are unfaithful, is it possible? And also, is it possible to recover from infidelity? And if yes, then how? The answers are simple. Not all men cheat, not all women cheat. Fidelity is possible. Also, several marriages and relationships have survived infidelity. So, it is possible to recover from infidelity if and only if both parties are willing. Please underline the phrase, if and only if both parties are willing. You see, if you're not willing, if both parties precisely are not willing to recover from it, then you will not recover from it. I'm not talking about the pretentious, well, let's make it up. I'm talking about a real and deep commitment to recover. In counseling, you'd find that sometimes people stay in a relationship because of what the relationship gives to them in terms of social value and not because they need the relationship. So, for example, sometimes after infidelity, maybe especially when it's done on a woman, in some cultures, the woman is going to remain in the relationship because in some cultures, women are shamed when their husband is unfaithful to them. And so she may stay in the relationship simply because she does not want to endure the shame that society is going to place on her and not because she's willing to work on it. That makes it really tough. And so in infidelity recovery counseling, there are so many things that we consider, which I may not be able to cover in this one teaching. However, recovery is much harder if you're caught in the act if you're caught lying or caught trying to hide and especially after many years and if infidelity went on for long. You see, there is a difference when somebody opens up about infidelity and when they are caught in infidelity. There's a difference when somebody is caught lying about their infidelity and when they say the truth. All of these will make recovery either harder or easier. Now, let me suggest some things. I call this a simple 10-step process to consider. Number one, if you have been unfaithful to your partner, the first thing to do, and I need to take my time to say this, is to open up about it to your partner. No matter how many people you tell, make sure you tell your partner. Let them hear it from your mouth. Your partner should not hear about your infidelity from a third party, from the streets, from roadside gossip, from, from church or any other area. They should hear about infidelity from you. Now, this is obviously the most difficult thing to do, but it is a necessary first step. If you do not open up to your partner about it, then there is nothing that says you actually want to change and actually value them. So, do not hold back any detail. Please, when you're opening up, provide every detail possible. Tell your partner everything. When your partner has to guess what happened, where it happened, how it happened, that usually is a trigger for them. 
So don't even give them room to think. When you go to open up, just open up everything. Sometimes they may tell you, please, I don't want to hear about it. If you can, tell them, please, I need to talk about it. Please, I need to process this and open up everything. They should not imagine. Okay, let them know that you really messed up really bad. Go and open up to your partner with your own mouth. Do not be caught. All right. Or if you are caught, quickly and immediately agree. I understand that these things sound difficult, but this is the very first step to recovery. Number two, tender a sincere apology. Now, I understand that there are different apology languages and it will be nice to know your partner's apology language. In fact, there are even tests for knowing your partner's apology language which you can take. You see, people have different ways that they want you to apologize and that's normal. That's basic psychology. For example, some people simply want you to take responsibility for your action. Others usually just need to hear the words, I'm sorry. Other people, the only apology is changed behavior. There, there are about five types of apology languages and I would insert the link to apology language test under this video. So you can actually take that language to know even for yourself how you would want someone to apologize to you. But you see, the best apology after infidelity is a cocktail of all apology languages. Let me tell you something. Do everything. Take responsibility for your action. Expressly say you are sorry. Say how you will act differently next time. And possibly even say where you need help from them. Do everything. Apologize in all languages. Don't hold back your apology. Number three. Give your partner room and time to process the information. No matter how legitimate your reason seems to you, the end point of all infidelity means that one was unable to say no to a third party for the sake of their relationship. So no matter whether I met your needs or I did not meet your needs, whether it's a pattern from your father and your grandfather, no matter what the root of your infidelity is, it boils down to one simple fact that you were faced with a third party who is not a part of this relationship, whom you're not committed to, and you chose to be unfaithful. You chose to say yes to them and to betray this relationship. That is all your partner is thinking. And therefore, your partner has the right to be hurt. They have the right to be angry. They have the right to be frustrated. So give them time to process. No matter how guilty you already feel about the act and how tempted you are to tell them that you have sinned before the Lord and not before them, that is wrong. You have sinned before the Lord and before your partner. See, no matter how guilty you already feel, give your partner the time and the space to process, to process their feelings, their anger, and to express those feelings to you. Give them time to be angry. Give them space to feel. Don't force them into saying things like, I forgive you. Don't guilt trip them into taking the blame for your wrongdoing. Don't gaslight your partner. Absolutely do not play the victim. Give them room and time to process the information. This is not a time to tell them how they did not give you enough sex and they did not do something for you. This is not the time. If you chose infidelity, it's the wrong time to negotiate for your needs. I hope I'm not being too hard. And if I am, that's still okay. Infidelity is not the time you negotiate for your needs. The time to negotiate for those needs was before. And if your partner did not meet those needs, you were supposed to go for therapy or counseling. If you chose the path of infidelity, then this is no longer time to negotiate for your needs. Number four, the conversation may come up over and over again. And while you may feel frustrated because you already feel bad and guilty for your wrongdoing, your spouse should have the right to bring it up again so that they can discuss different aspects of your acts, its implications to your relationship and how they intend to move forward. So if your partner or your spouse wants to bring it up over and over again, let them bring it up and talk about it. And I can tell you this process is excruciating, but it is necessary. Number five. You too bring up the conversation to discuss roots. 
You see, sometimes they would bring it up. But to also show that you're changing, bring up the conversation. This should be at your partner's discretion and readiness. So feel free to tell your partner after you're fallen into infidelity, I would love to talk about it. Would you want us to talk about it? And during that conversation, talk about what you think made you susceptible to that infidelity. Why you think you said yes to it. How it is also affecting you and how you plan to move forward. Show your partner that you're processing your act, your wrongdoing, and how you really want to move from it. You see, you have to let them see if it was maybe the fruit of practice from your past, if it was because of unmet needs, if it was because of soul wounds, because of family heritage, or because you do not have a personal why. Bring it. Or maybe it was a cocktail of one or more of these roots. Bring all of this to the table for conversation and take time to talk about it with your partner. If they're not ready to talk about it, let them be. Number six, and this is very important, understand that there is a difference between forgiveness, healing, and restoration. Forgiveness is the choice to no longer hold your wrong against you. But healing means that when your partner thinks about that wrong, it no longer hurts their emotions. Restoration, however, means that they trust you as much as they did before or they have brought you back to the place or even better and honor you as they did before you were unfaithful to them. And so healing and restoration may take time even if your partner chooses to forgive you on day one. So do not over demand from your partner. Let them take their time. Number seven, it will take more time to rebuild trust and so the best way to rebuild trust is through vulnerable accountability. You see, once you have been unfaithful to your partner, your partner should never feel like you have any barriers, phone locks, late night calls, hidden outings, etc. You do not even have to wait for your partner to ask. Inform them about anything and everything even before they ask. And even if they never ask, be accountable. Be openly accountable. If you're coming back late, tell them, hey, I'm coming back late. Yes, where I am. If you're talking with somebody, tell them I'm talking with somebody. If you're developing feelings for someone else, say, hey, I developed feelings for this person or I gave this person a hug. I started having an erection. Let me tell you something. Sometimes it's going to seem annoying, but I tell you, you need to be overly accountable to your partner. It helps to rebuild trust. Trust me, no matter how embarrassing it is, tell them, hey, I gave this person a hug today. I felt an erection or I felt aroused. Oh, I felt comfort when this person spoke to me today. Oh, you know what? I'm talking with this, my colleague. Hey, I'm coming back late. I'm going for this meeting. Let them know everything. Don't let them ask. It tells your partner you are really working. It sounds theatric, but I can assure you, you should practice this if you fell into infidelity. Number eight, invest in prayer. Now, let me just say this, you don't need to do this in this exact order, especially after number one, all right? But invest in prayer. You see, who you pray for, you love, and whom you pray for, you also honor. And couples that pray for each other, especially together, remain faithful to each other. So don't just pray for your spouse or your partner when there's been infidelity. Also pray together, all right? Pray together so you can both hear the words of that prayer. Pray. Pray together. Invest in prayer. Prayer is so important when it comes to infidelity recovery. Number nine, and this is very important. In fact, for some people, this comes as number two. Talk to a trained counselor, an infidelity recovery specialist, a mentor, a pastor, or a mature person who can listen and provide counsel, aid, support, discipline, or even just accountability, talk to somebody. You see, it is very difficult to go through infidelity if you decide to hide. And because of shame, most couples think that they can handle this alone. The more you try to handle infidelity by yourself, just you and your partner, you see, 
you actually make yourself susceptible to it again because you are going through the guilt of your wrongdoing, your partner is going through the pain of your betrayal and when there's no third party that brings comfort and counsel, then sometimes both of you are going to find solace or comfort from a different person. So not opening up to a counselor or to somebody else actually makes you more susceptible to falling again. So this person will also help the fallen spouse to journey through a thorough wholeness and inner healing session, which not only permits them to properly repent for their wrongdoing, but also rebuilds their defenses and equips them to say no to infidelity in the future. You need somebody. Find somebody you trust and together go open up to that person. Number 10 and lastly, when there has been infidelity, couples are advised, especially after there's a decision for forgiveness and healing is ongoing, to intentionally invest in intimacy. Spend time together. If there has been unfaithfulness and sometimes if this was the fruit of unmet needs, then it might be more difficult. It needs a lot of counseling. If this was a fruit of broken intimacy, all right, then there is a need for deeper counseling. But I tell you, couples need to invest in intimacy after infidelity. Now, this is not in a bid to cover the whole of the wrongdoing, but to invest in a solid foundation or in a stronger foundation for the future. It is usually easier to invest in rebuilding intimacy when all the other nine points have been done or at least are being done or attempted. So don't try to invest in intimacy if you have not opened up about it, if you have not tendered a sincere apology, if you have not given them room to process the information, to bring the conversation over and over, to probably bring it up yourself, to understand them you see, to rebuild trust, all of that. So if you have not done all of these other things, including praying and talking to a counselor, it might be very difficult to invest in rebuilding intimacy. At the end of the day, here are some general things to consider when it comes to infidelity recovery. Number one, recovery is only possible if both parties are willing and ready to do the work. Number two, if your partner feels taken for granted, or if the act keeps repeating itself over and over, then it makes forgiveness, healing, and recovery even harder. Number three, while infidelity is a serious thing in a relationship, it is important to note that if you are a loving, forgiving, honoring, and gracious person, then you will find it easier to forgive any wrong, especially when there is a sincere apology and vulnerability. If this is not who you are or if these are not characteristics that you possess and have developed over time, then you may tend to blame your inability to love and forgive on your partner's act. However, understand that people have developed their love and forgiveness muscles at different rates. All right, So don't condemn your partner if they are taking long to forgive you. It simply says that they are still developing their forgiveness. And so on this point, I'm putting the responsibility on both people. If you're struggling to forgive, then in general, that's a value that you're still developing. If you're struggling to honor, then in general, that's a value that you're still developing. And that's okay. Take time and develop that value. However, if you have also caused wrong on the other person, give them time to forgive and to honor you. Okay? If, if you've been unfaithful to your wife, it's okay if she looks at you and says things like you are no king, like you messed up really bad. And then you take time and you work your way back to her honor and respect for you. Okay? Don't take the short road. You've done the bad thing. Take time to rebuild that trust. Number four, recovery happens at different paces for different couples and for different acts of sexual or erotic activity and stimulation with a third party. For some people, if you as much as flirt with somebody else, the relationship is over. Well, for other people, it may take deeper things for them to end the relationship. So be very careful because you might think an act is not so serious to you, 
but your partner may take too long to recover. If you go ahead sexting somebody else, that may be the end of your relationship. So do not invest in any acts of sexual stimulation or erotic stimulation with a third party. Just don't, all right? It doesn't matter what your partner thinks about it. It is wrong before God. And number five, if the Lord does not help you, then there might be forgiveness and even healing, but recovery of trust and connection might just never happen. You need God to restore and to bind your union again together, especially if you were married. And I'd like to add this number six. If there is infidelity with somebody you are dating, take time to go through sincere and severe counseling to ensure that the person has dealt with those roots and to talk about how you will work on this, all right? So it does not happen in marriage. Because when somebody is unfaithful to you when you're still dating them or engaged to them, they will most likely do it again in marriage if you do not take time to deal with the roots of it. That is so important. And many people despise this. They think, well, he did it because we're not having sex. Well, he's going to do it again. You see what I'm saying? Or she did it because I was not present. Well, she's going to do it again. Don't blame yourself for someone else's infidelity. Never. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 4, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 2, the verses 13 to 16, I'll be reading from the Amplified. The Bible says, This is another thing that you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with your own weeping and sighing, because the Lord no longer regards your offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he reject it? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your marriage companion and the wife of your covenant made by your vows. Now, when you read right down to verse 16, you see the Bible says God hates divorce. The Bible is basically saying that if you're unfaithful to the wife of your youth or to your partner, then the Lord will stop to accept your prayer and to receive your offering. In other words, God really considers fidelity to your partner a serious thing. Here's what you can do today. Number one, if you're not in a relationship or even if you're in one, then listen to this teaching again and take notes on questions to ask your partner from the five causes or roots of infidelity. Their responses will tell you their level of exposure so that you can pray together, you can plan and you can build a fidelity plan together. Now, let me tell you something. You have to ask the right questions. Have you had any form of practice? Is there infidelity in your roots? You see, do you have any particular needs or sore wounds? So prepare enough questions from those five points. Number two, if you're in a relationship, then create an accountability sheet or questions with which you will sit together at least once every month to have open, honest and vulnerable conversation. If you do not inspect what you expect, then you should perhaps be getting ready for hurt. So, learn to have inspection or monitoring systems. Learn to sit with your spouse and say, did you look at anybody lustfully? Did you admire somebody? Did somebody turn you on or trigger you this month? Did somebody make you feel more loved than I make you feel? These are questions that couples should ask. And in our counseling systems, we have some of these questions. And this is so important so that you can actually sit with your spouse and have these questions answered. Number three, if there has been infidelity in your relationship, then follow all the points I stated and carefully apply them, all right? The points on infidelity recovery, I give 10 points. Please just follow them diligently and you'll be helped. And number four, pray about fidelity in your relationship. You see, when your partner is faithful to you, you can easily just boast about it or think that it is by your doing. But I can assure you, unless the Lord builds a house, they that build are building in vain. Well, today's teaching has been unusually long. And that's because 
This was a subject we have been thinking about how do we bring infidelity recovery to the 40 day of sexual purity series. Well, we finally found a way to bring it in just before the end and I think it is a very important teaching. If this teaching has blessed you, if you have learned a lot from this teaching, please drop a comment and don't forget to share. I pray for you in the name of Jesus that today's teaching will not just be an eye opener but it will be a foundation to rebuild broken walls. I pray that by reason of this, couples are going to be restored, marriages are going to be restored. I pray that by reason of this, you would have the patience to sit down to build fidelity plans and structures to monitor and to stay faithful to each other. I pray that you will understand the work that goes in to fidelity and to doing marriage God's way. I pray that you will not overlook things. I pray that you will not avoid hard conversations. I pray that you will not despise the role of monitoring, accountability and inspection, but that with honor and love, you would have a culture that brings you and your partner together at least once every month just to inspect and give account. I pray that you will invest in intimacy with your partner. I also pray for couples and marriages or relationships that were broken as a result of infidelity i pray that the mercy of god will see you through i plead the mercy of god on your behalf i plead the mercy of god i plead the mercy of god tell it not in god the mighty have fallen i pray for you today that god's mercy will come upon you i pray that you will realize that this is a serious thing and my, my eyes are just welling up with tears right now and I, I'm just praying for that couple out there that is suffering, that couple that is broken. I pray that the mercy of God will locate you. I pray that you will not give up on your relationship, especially the married couples. You will not give up on your marriage, but that the Lord who hates divorce will come back and to restore the love, the connection, the intimacy and the companionship that once existed. I pray that the Lord will bring a spark into your relationship, especially your marital relationship. And if you have fallen, receive the mercy of God today. Receive the courage of the Holy Spirit to open up about your fall. I pray that you will not hide your, the wrong foundations, but you will open up and receive freedom. I declare that the devil will not win in our marriages. He will not win over the marriages that God has put together. The devil will not win in the family mountain. And I pray that we are going to see successful marriages, restored homes. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it was beautiful having you on today's meditation. This was much more than a meditation, a teaching that you need to sit and consume properly. Well, I cannot wait to see you tomorrow as we are almost concluding. God bless you. Goodbye.